So we should start. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, very special online panel. Uh, we are going to this uh, in this uh, panel, we are going to discuss the most pressing questions about the biggest topic in cloud IT. And those will be the changes to VMware licensing and bundling uh, with the Broadcom acquisition. We want to discuss how it affects us as technology partners, as uh, business owners, as cloud service providers, and so on. Uh, so the focus will be the future of your business, how they, it affects your business, how it impacts the IT strategies uh, for companies um, uh, that are buying and selling cloud. And of course, how uh, any of those changes have created an even more pressing need for solutions that are based on open source technologies. My name is Ronnie Moyal. I'm uh, your host from uh, Virtuoso. Uh, we are joined today by three very special guests. Uh, we have uh, none in alphabetical order. We have uh, Tim Tim Rawi, founder and CEO of Shark Tech. Tim, raise your hand. Hey. Uh, we have uh, Cliff Greenberg, founder and CEO of Livewire, and Jimmy McCarter, director of business development at Open Infra at the Open Infra Foundation. Before I let my panel introduce themselves, um, some um, house clearing. Um, in this panel, we will answer questions that were pre-submitted, but feel free to send us additional questions uh, using the QA tool in Zoom. If you want, uh, I, we can point you to where it is. If there are still open questions after the panel, please uh, share them with us. We will follow up by email uh, later on. One last thing before we begin, this session will be recorded. Um, so you'll be noticed. Uh, we will share the link of the recording um, to anyone that was registered to the panel. Feel free to share it with whomever was not registered but still need the link for uh, this recording. Okay, so we'll uh, get started. Let me see uh, kind of where we are. So we are at 62 participants. I think it's uh, uh, it shows the level of interest in those changes, the level of, I would say, frustration and opportunity uh, in those changes. Um, so I'll introduce um, uh, Cliff, followed by Jimmy and Tim. Uh, Cliff, give us a few words about you. Uh, my name is Cliff Greenberg. I'm the CEO and founder of Livewire Cloud. We're an MSP-centric cloud service provider um, providing OpenStack, Proxmox, and VMware virtualization technologies in a uh, private cloud configuration specifically to the MSP community. So. We have a probably a very different perspective than the other panelists uh, based on who our end user community is. Yep, very diverse and um, and a longtime partner of Virtuoso as well. Uh, followed by uh, by Jimmy. Yes, uh, you Jimmy McArthur with yep. the Open Info Foundation. Uh, I do business development for the foundation. I've been here uh, about eight years, and uh, my my goal is to to spend every day. Uh, talking to folks around the world that are using OpenStack uh, and, and using open infrastructure software uh, and see how the, the foundation can be of assistance. Thank you. And Tim? Hi, my name is Tim Timurawi. I'm the founder and CEO of Shark Tech. Uh, we are a hosting provider that's been in business for the past 20 years. Uh, we started with infrastructure as a infrastructure as a service uh, provider with DDoS protection and we moved into the cloud solution provider. And now we provide the public cloud solution services and uh, bare metal services and private cloud. Thank you very much, Tim. So with that, we do have a few questions that we want to cover, or the discussion will have some core questions that we want to answer. And um, the, the, the first question I want to kind of hand it off to, to Cliff. Um, since I know your background, I know um, the type of solutions that you've supported. Um, what is uh, what are the main pain points uh, that you've seen from customers and partners of yours uh, with the changes in with Broadcom and VMware and the bundling and, and prices? Um, well, specifically, I think the biggest pain point is uh, the new pricing architecture and um, the uh, degree with which Broadcom came into the picture and put aggressive timeframes into the modification of um, of the licensure structure. So 
uh, yesteryear uh, before the Broadcom merger, everything was based on, um, you know, vSAN size of pools and memory allocation and had nothing to do with core count or CPU. And today, everything is based on core count um, within each server. Um, initially, there was only a single um, VMware partner um, tier. And mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest modifications is some some existing partners weren't even able to become resellers. Uh, they were ejected from the community altogether. And the ones that made reseller status had to go and find a premier partner uh, to procure their licenses from. So that's a very awkward uh, go buy your licenses from your competitor um, <clears throat> because you're unable to uh, meet the financial uh, milestones created by VMware. And then, of course, uh, the aggressiveness with which the program was adopted and the lack of communication across the industry um, when is my stuff going to stop working is, you know, are they going to honor my current, um, you know, subscription program uh, after the merger? So lots of questions, very few answers, then a lot of pushback. And then to throw insult to, to injury, um, they announced that they're selling off the end user computing, computing division to KKR. So the yep. VMware Horizon um uh, is now an additional quandary on top of, um, you know, your traditional uh, vCloud director and vSphere infrastructure uh, solutions. So a lot of pain for a lot of people. I think the only saving grace is they introduced another tier uh, to the partner communities that is a little bit more cost effective. Um, but it's caused people to think uh, dramatically about whether or not they're with the correct solution. And... Yep many people aren't going to be able to afford the new pricing structure. And um, and then Amazon was removed as one of the premier partners. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of changes with respect to the way VMware is adopted and who is using it and how. Thank you. Uh, Tim, you want to give us your perspective? Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a situation of uh, the people that are developing the software are disconnected from the people that are administering the software and managing the systems. Um, there seems to be uh, it is a complex system. Uh, the people that are administering it are realizing that we're you know being stuck with solutions that they might change on a dime based on different corporate interests. And uh, we are left uh, hanging there trying to decipher complex solutions and complex alternatives um, instead of, you know, focusing on the business core, which is providing the service to our customers and making sure that our infrastructure is ready and available um, for our customers or our businesses. Um, it's, it's been difficult because VMware has been, um, a trademark, you know, system for the past couple of decades, at least. And everybody seems to have, you know, reached a point where we're relaxed, uh, with the system. Um, it is, I hope going to be an eye opener and, uh, uh, able to help the community recognize where, what is best for us to move forward without being dependent on uh, single entities uh, like VMware. Mm -hmm. Do you see um, uh, do you see those changes in cost structure being rolled over to the customer 100% or being absorbed by the uh, cloud service provider? The cloud service providers are already, you know, um, it, it's it's a very complex uh, time for us right now. And uh, I am definitely sure that whoever is going to be succeeding in adopting or understanding the new um, pricing structures, there it's going to be uh, sent back to the customers, whoever decides to go into this. The problem then is who is going to be on the other side, right? Who is going to be ending up recognizing that, hey, we need to change. Um, and investing their time and resources in uh, finding alternative solutions and recognizing the cost effectiveness of the other solutions and seeing that, okay, we're going to be able to compete. And that's a beautiful thing about, you know, CSPs right now. We are still a competitive market. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, for us, the not the top three 
uh, providers. We're still a competitive market and uh, finding ways to provide a unique cost-effective solution and a strong solution is still uh, very important. We do get some feedback from other markets. So the Americas, the margins are as such that you know, some some will be rolled to the customers from our perspective. Some will be staying within the CSP, so the margin will shrink a little bit. But there is enough to sustain, um, or, or for VMware to still be relevant. But we do see in other markets, global markets, where VMware was priced as such that it was just barely sufficient for the CSP to make any margin because the customers will not be able to pay more than what they were paying. And with the changes, it kind of priced itself out of the reach of customers, even government entities. Uh, do you guys see that happening here? If, uh, you know, whoever decide to stay with VMware? I, I think I can answer that to some degree. Um, I, I really believe it depends on how you run your business to some extent and CapEx versus OpEx models. And most people have adopted cloud in an effort to move to a more OPEX pay-as-you-go type of situation to be able to scale up and scale down and um, to uh, afford themselves the ability to um, maintain certain degrees of profitability through this relationship with the cloud vendors. And, um, and so much of that is being destroyed to some extent by VMware's uh, aggressive adoption of three-year commitments uh, as being the only mechanism to bring your costs to a reasonable level. And so- and Also paying for the full capacity up front. So it's not pay as you grow, it's commit to the full capacity of your data center. Correct. Then you figure it out. Correct. So that first tier of uh, partnership, the premier tier is um, 3,500 cores. Um, minimum 16 cores per server. You can imagine we, we started to look at, well, what if we took a processor out of the server, <laughs> you know, and had to start uh, rethinking everything from that perspective to try to create cost-effective models for our um, our MSP partners. And um, when you do that, you, you degrade the server's performance and the, the server's ability to support other um, infrastructure such as memory and, and disk and PCI uh, bus and other, I mean, there's so many uh, affiliated ramifications, yeah. ripple effect down the road. Um, so today we're seeing like on a pay as you go models, no less than $35 a core per month, minimum 16 core per server. So a single server is almost $500 a month in VMware licensure at our cost under a pay as you go model. And th that's a, a dramatic increase over the prior um, licensure model uh, where CPU wasn't relevant at all in the VSCPP um, solution provider space. So in a way it does play to the hyperscalers because it kind of shrinks the benefit of OPEX versus, you know, hyper hyperscalers. So Correct. If, if, if it was 30% or more um, <clears throat> reduction in cost, it shrinks that and it does call for alternative for CSPs to be able to um, maintain, reduce the cost and stay on the pay as you grow versus buy the capacity and hope you can sell it. Correct. And, um, and then, you know, oversubscription was you know, a possibility way back when, but now none of that is doable to some extent. And neither is the shrinkage model. Like what happens if you have to lay off people? You're still yeah. stuck in this cost uh, center at yeah. the uh, resource pool that you committed to. So that's a difficult position to put yourself in. Yep. Okay, uh, um, we'll move to the next question. Uh, and I'll start with Jimmy this time. Uh, do you think that this, um, do you think that this has created a turning point for adoption of open source based cloud. So from all we heard in question number one, Jimmy, do you see that as a motivation for uh, CSPs, for partners, for customers, enterprise customers to adopt uh, open source or open stack? Yeah, I think Tim, Tim put it best, which is, you know, it, it's eyes, eyes open a bit this year. And I, I think, you know, 2024 is the year we, we all learned a valuable lesson, which is, proprietary and single vendor uh, open source software 
single vendor open source software, it makes your business vulnerable, right? And and I hope what we take away from the end of the year is that multi-vendor open source projects with a healthy ecosystem are the way forward. Um, you know, the, the question about, you know, locking in prices with VMware for three years, you know, CSPs have to scale up their entire infrastructure based on what their customer base looks like, right? And if you lose one of those, but you're still paying for all that infrastructure for with a VMware license, you're out of business. And so, you know, you, you've got to look at alternatives. You've got to look at open source alternatives. And in my opinion, I, th I think OpenStack is, is the way forward. You know, it's, uh, if you combine OpenStack and, and the situation with VMware with other trends in the market, like privacy and data sovereignty, and what we're seeing with the need for uh, greater compute power for AI workloads, OpenStack is a natural fit for that kind of thing. Uh, and, and I think, you know, VMware, for better or worse, has sent a message to the, to the industry, and, and I hope uh, everybody learns something from it. Jimmy, you really like took the words out of my mouth on that one. I, I really hope so. I hope we as a community start recognizing the the difficult positions we're putting ourselves in, taking the easy way forward. Um, it, it is a problem, and I hope we uh, recognize the this as a problem and see uh, alternative ways forward. Um, what you brought in with the AI situation is very important. Um, do you want to end up in a position where you are locked, where you are unable to innovate on your own when a new technology comes in? Uh, right. Do you want to be in a position where you are dependent on a, a closed source kind of a VMware solution um, that will end up put you in a position, well, I have to wait for them to develop this solution for GPU, for example, or I can work, I can work on the OpenStack solution that we have to develop um, in a unique way um, to provide this type of service. Uh, Cost-wise, I mean, if you are in a CSP service and, and you you see the price models that Cliff shared with us, and, and you think that this is okay, um, I'm really happy for you. Um, this is just not how our industry works. Um, yeah. And this tells you the disconnect that VMware has with the industry. Um, this is just not how our business models ever work. Uh, we are very scalable. We go up all the time. We hopefully never go down, but you know, sometimes uh, we have to yeah. be careful about when we have to go down, right? Mm -hmm. We have to, uh, to scale down. We have to be uh, cognizant about what should we be doing when we have to scale down. Um, in those kind of scenarios and how difficult it is to scale up and scale down and the pricing model, which really puts us at a disadvantage, um, this is something to be taken seriously. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, Cliff, anything to add on uh, on this question? I think I'm going to pass on this one because uh, I was <laughs> verbose with the other ones, but <laughs> I, I will have stuff to contribute later, I promise. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, so we have uh, our next kind of item to discuss is uh, considering the current uh, 2024 state of the economy and the IT, uh, IT trends in general, how does OpenStack open source provide a way forward to the business? So we answered some of it, but um, Jimmy, I want you to elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, sure. And I mean, OpenStack is uh, a cloud computing platform uh, that provides infrastructure as a service, whereas, you know, vSphere is a virtualization platform. Um, and it's been a fine solution for a lot of folks for a long time. Uh, but if it's not cost effective, you've got to start looking around. And I think further, you know, in this day and age, you should be going cloud native. Um, it's, it's kind of the natural way of things right now um, and, and avoiding vendor lock-in, you know, you look no further than, uh, you know, obviously VMware, but also what recently happened with HashiCorp, like we're in a situation where, you know, you've got to be looking at open source in, in the same way that you would like Linux is the de facto open source OS. Like, why would you look at anything else? I mean, Linux won. And I, I think, I hope 
we look back and and see uh, that everybody has moved on to to proper open source solutions for their infrastructure as well. Thank you, Tim. You want to add to that? Yes, um, that's also again, Jimmy. That's a great point. So, you know, when we started with Linux long time ago and FreeBSD and all of those, we we recognized the 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 open solution that it provided. Um, when now we have reached the point where we are looking for something that orchestrates multiple systems at the same time, an infrastructure of networks, uh, servers, storage nodes, and all of that. And we have reached a, a new layer in systems management. Uh, OpenStack is key on that, the same as Linux was for operating systems. Um, our ability to innovate on OpenStack is similar to how we were able to innovate uh, back in the day on FreeBSD, on Linux, on OpenBSD. Um, without you know the support, uh, without uh, the FreeBSD, for example, Shark Tank would not have existed in 2002 when we when we took on DDoS protection as a service uh, as a first company that actually provided that. Um, mm -hmm. And now we're doing the exact same thing, and we're really excited. And for the first time, you know, in over a decade, we, our, my team has been absolutely uh, enlightened and happy that we are able to actually innovate again, and we are able to create unique uh, solutions that puts us out there on a, on a different level. Um, and uh, yes, uh, partnering up with companies, and now I'm gonna put the plug for Virtuoso, um, partnering with companies like Virtuoso that have dedicated themselves to creating solutions that are that makes uh, the adoption of OpenStack possible is an important step. Um, so OpenStack, as many know, okay, it's not easy. Um, it's getting easier. It's getting uh, better, um, but you definitely need guardrails. You definitely need help uh, moving forward with it. And yep. this is when we went with, we decided four years ago to go with Virtuoso and uh, Virtuoso has been that for us. The, the solution that they have created based on OpenStack has been tremendously helpful for us. Um, it provided us uh, the, the path forward and uh, the opportunity uh, for us. Thank yeah, I would, I would add to that, uh, Tim, that there are a number of distributions out there, Virtuoso being one of them. Um, and, and for folks that do need those guardrails, that's the beauty of OpenStack, right? Mm -hmm. There are distributions, they're enterprise grade. Uh, you can set it up and you can have the kind of service that you might have expected from v VMware back in the day. Um, but there's also you know, just pure open source, vanilla open stack. And for those folks that are capable and are interested, you can also set up and, and run a data center with a few engineers. You know, it, it doesn't, there's there's this idea that open stack is so complicated and so hard that you've got to have this team of 20 or 30 people to manage it and 20 or 30 people to set it up. But that's just not reality anymore. And, no, that's a decade ago. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. Still, so if, if, you, if you are a small a commercialized way, I think that uh, Virtuoso and a few other ones, and we're not the only one in the market, um, they are as good the source that you need to commercialize and commer commercialization of a product is not in the nature of open source, open stack. It's, it's more about open. It's um, here is the kind of the source code. Here, here are the tools to create your own cake. Just um, and and if somebody is taking all those great ingredients and making something that is easy for you to go to market and reduce your operation cost because you need smaller team, you can focus on selling to customers, collecting from customers. I think there is a service for the likes of Virtuoso. And again, we're not alone there uh, that commercializing um, open stack, open source. Oh, absolutely. So uh, one sec, Jimmy, about that. So basically we were able to create a billable hourly rate system, a cloud solution, a virtual data center environment for our customers and build them on resources used on hourly basis, basically utilizing the Virtuoso uh, tools uh, and OpenStack for our customers. So this has allowed us to bring it on to uh, the commercial side 
um, significantly easier than we have if you ever have gone straight out to OpenStack and uh, developed and took the time to actually develop the system directly ourselves. Um, yeah. You know, r right now we are at the point where it's a double, it's a couple of clicks on our website, and uh, you're done. You have an open cloud, so OpenStack solution uh, developed and provided to you as a customer, and you go with it. Um, and this is amazing. I don't think uh, we would have been able to do that without the support of Virtues or OpenStack. Thank you. Yeah, I think I have a slightly different perspective, Ronnie, than the yeah. other guys. I mean, for me, I I view VMware as a a virtualization technology, but not a multi-tenant uh, cloud infrastructure solution. And mm -hmm. VMware doesn't scale um, massively. It, it can certainly scale in a hyper-converged configuration to some extent, but nowhere near the capability and the mm -hmm. ability to introduce heterogeneous uh, hardware into the stack uh, yeah. VMware cannot do that. And so this is one of the biggest differentiators between OpenStack and VMware. OpenStack is a multi-tenant, multi-tiered uh, solution with wonderfully written SDKs, and you guys help provide those and the proper API interfaces for it to do it. But the biggest difference is OpenStack scales massively and just gets stronger and more stable as you do so in better performance, better everything, um, tiers of disks. Um, I think the biggest challenge is it's not open to every other uh, technology out there. So there's going to be technology adoption that are going to influence some of your strategic decisions in terms of embracing a virtualization environment, right? If you have I expertise. Think, I don't think it's part of the service air quotation that VMware is doing to open open stack, uh, the disruption will cause more of the ecosystem providers to reconsider open stack, to be part of open stack, to augment open stack, rather than focusing on a on a on a company that have an interest to grow, which is fine, but have an interest to have captive audience. And to do that, you make sure that you are able to sell them this and you are able to sell them products that are working in your closed garden, which is all fine because this is the motivation of the company. That's why they were brought by, uh, bought by Broadcom. But sure. if you if you bring uh, open source, open stack into that, it's a more um, noble approach because it's not about serving one market segment. It's not about serving the need or of the you know the uh, the investors of Broadcom, it's more about serving the community. And if you take the flavor of OpenStack that you need and, and commercialize it uh, correctly, you answer more use cases than the one that are, are driven by your investors. Honestly, I don't know why Broadcom bought VMware, but <laughs> that's... Uh, that's well, the only cool. reason a chip manufacturer okay. would buy a virtualization technology is if they want to embed the technology into the chip. And the latest how, release, how that get this, so is far? Broadcom might buy Intel, which that one blew my mind. So <laughs> that's the latest oh. press release that I read the yeah, other see, day. I can, I could see that. <laughs> like, I could see that... Fitting more the Broadcom mentality, um, like I could see them buying Cisco, for example, maybe that's like, that makes sense. Um, buying VMware has never been, it never made sense to me. Um, it, it's, but then again, it happened and doesn't need to make sense to anyone, I guess. Time will tell, time will tell. So actually that leads us to the time next has been telling. It has been. Uh, do you think that Broadcom VMware changes have created lasting distrust in the real stability of established platform. This is I hope like so. a perfect segue to that. So, um, well, Tim, I, I would love answer. to tease. Oh, it's Tim Stern. Okay, go, Tim. Uh, oh, okay. Please, go I, I really, I really, really hope so. You know, I'm, I really hope that uh, it's it, we're reaching the point that we're starting to recognize how important it is to um, to be cognizant of the systems that we're using and who is behind those systems. Um, and knowing that, you know, building a system that requires specialty hardware, specialty software, 
and being dependent on those and then saying, oh yeah, now they're scaling up the price on us and then increasing the prices on us. And then we're like, we're left with a, with a situation that we simply cannot afford because they do not recognize the type of businesses and the models that we are providing. That's a big problem. And I hope we have reached the point that, you know, we learned our lesson and uh, we're starting to look seriously at OpenStack as we did for Linux back 20 years ago. Okay, and Cliff, your chance. Uh, I think that, um, you know, past behavior is a wonderful indicator of what your future behavior is going to be. And if we look at Broadcom's past behaviors and the companies that they bought dismantled and practically destroyed for a piece of technology that they were interested in, and the list is fairly lengthy, you know, Computer Associates is the one that comes to my mind initially, but LSI. all of that, all those products have, you know, evaporated from our technology, uh, from the technology ethers. Um, yeah. So... I think the motivating factors of an organization like Broadcom are clipped very close to the heart, and it's not going to be divulged to us. And um, and we're not in sync with them. Uh, the communities that support and provide these services have different motivating um, decision making ideas and and concepts about providing you know, infrastructure as a service and other, we are not aligned with the vendor in our goals. And that's the biggest challenge. And I think we were previously aligned with VMware. I think they recognize their own strengths to some extent, but now I have zero confidence in um, the future direction of the product. And um, we're already seeing them tear it apart even further. Um, and I think, I think they missed the boat in some regard uh, at Tanzu to run Kubernetes and Docker containers within VMware was a joke. I mean, I don't know anybody that embraced it or used it, but here's another big differentiator with regards to OpenStack. It natively supports, you know, containers and microservices, which we all agree is, you know, is the serverless way of the future, right? Um, and so if you don't have a technology platform that can support future solutions that are eminent and being developed every day, then um, people aren't gonna have a choice but to jump ship and find something that uh, works to meet their needs at the end of the day. And yeah. Tim, you want to add? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's you know as I mentioned earlier, if 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 you want to go cloud native, OpenStack is is the way to go. And you know what we're seeing and what we see with uh, our users is everyone's running workloads. They're running Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. Uh, it's a natural fit. And you know who's not running Kubernetes these days? And I think you know that's that's just the the way of the future and uh you know unfortunately i think you know it's it's a sad tale about vmware but i think it's an opportunity for open source communities to embrace uh a, a bunch of new users and and show people that it's it's uh, the right way to to move your business forward okay now with that do you see uh, any other leading technologies that kind of on the precipice of of being um, bought, sold, changing their kind of DNA? Is it, is it, so, you know, I, I don't want to name names, but there are a few other technologies around virtualization that are, have kind of the same approach, you know, proprietary hardware, closed garden. Do you see this wave of um, companies being bought, changing their DNA, moving from focus uh, where the uh, customer partner being the focus to Let's turn it into a cash machine. Do you see any that this, is, about this is the way this is the way these days, unfortunately. You know, um, there's a lot of investors out there. There's a lot of uh, business opportunities out there that they're looking at uh, well-established software development companies um, to take them on, to take them on and uh, re, uh, re uh, basically take on customers that are already locked in 
a solution and uh, taking advantage of it for as much as, for as long as they can for as much as they can it's unfortunately we're seeing it and it's not only in you know virtualization platforms it's yeah. in a lot of software as a service providers um situation and uh, a lot of customers are ending up being locked in uh, these location in, in these situations with really even when they have an alternative it's extremely difficult to see it because they are so busy with the current situation that they are in um, mm -hmm. that uh, it's difficult for them to see uh, alternatives. Yeah, and so, I think it's also, right. I, I was gonna say, I, I think it's important to understand why multi-vendor open source projects in a healthy community around an open source project is the most important thing when choosing an open source project or choosing software, um, you know, proprietary is is one thing, but when you have a single vendor open source project that switches the license on the fly, and all of a sudden you're you're just as locked in as you would have been with with VMware, um, that's bad as well. And so you you know companies that are kind of this is why, in my opinion, uh, you know companies that are kind of masquerading as open source, but they're really not, they don't have an ecosystem built around it. They don't have uh other partners and and organizations committing to that open source project and keeping it healthy then you're going to run into that problem and you know this is the reason that pure open source is the best way to to manage to to make software decisions so jimmy your best advice to any partner that is looking to move from vmware to any other solution is don't make the same mistake twice. Don't jump from one closed garden to another closed garden to from one company that is was ripe to be sold to another company that is ripe to be sold uh, with a closed garden. I, that is absolutely my position. And I would say also like there's, you know, people tout VMware because it had, well, first of all, it was around forever. Um, you know, as as Cliff points out, there's a, a, a big ecosystem around it. I think mm -hmm. those things and, and that security of, of having the service contract and things like that, those things exist with open source projects. It exists with OpenStack. You know, there's a large ecosystem around OpenStack that does things like backup, monitoring, metering, storage, uh, you know, data recovery. Those things yeah. all exist, but it, it hasn't been at the forefront of a lot of those organizations that they haven't been pushing it because OpenStack, for lack of a better word, has has been uh, has a tough reputation. And it's something that we at the Open Infra Foundation and we with our ecosystem partners are, are, are really trying to overcome. And I hope that this is an opportunity for people to see that this is a safe place to, to put your workloads. OpenStack is a safe place and it's a great place for you to, to run your infrastructure. Um, so hopefully that message gets through. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I'm in agreement with Tim. I mean, I think our job as cloud service providers is to educate our potential customers on the cap capabilities and the best practices to embrace open source technology. And I think security is tantamount to any solution that's out there. And I have to tell you that the Virtuoso OpenStack is hardened and um, has withstood uh, the test of time with respect to uh, vulnerability and assault. And um, even though you can layer additional security on top of it, um, you know, that is a really important component to uh, providing cloud services. Absolutely. I can tell you that the yeah. moment you're exposed and have compromised customers, uh, that's a very yeah. bad day for everybody. So oh, yeah. absolutely, Cliff, I'd like to add on to that. I mean, this is the most important part right there. Um, for for us, you know, security is a multi-layered approach. Um, security is being able to use independent systems to protect each other, um, to create a layered approach into security. Um, using something like OpenStack, we are able to, to utilize, you know, third-party software, third-party firewalls, appliances, um, in front of these systems to protect them, to analyze the data going to them. And they are completely independent um, of our OpenStack environments, right? Um, and we are able to say, okay, this is something that right here. So in case of any vulnerability that's gonna happen in the stack, 
it is segmented. Um, and it, we create uh, we create basically air gap solution air, air, air gap situations where we are able to address the issues. Um, and uh, this is we are able to do that with OpenStack solutions, right? We're able with open source solutions. We are actually able to uh, create unique solutions that us, the ones in the trenches, are seeing and recognizing. And we do not have to go back, write a, a recommendation to a VMware that in all likelihood is not gonna align with uh, their business models or something they're gonna be like, oh yeah, we can create a new system to add on top of this um, because hey, that's another revenue stream for us. No, we are able to work with the open source community. We are able to develop our own solutions um, and bring it in. Um, and be a unique solution provider out there as well. Now, quick question. Um, so the wave of um, customers who are looking for alternative to VMware started somewhere around November, 2023 with, with the changes being announced a little bit before, but kind of the big wave, the front of the wave was November till today. Do you see the community of VMware customers or partners that are looking for alternative, is it ending? Is it in the midst of it? Is it depending on where your contract is done, when you need the hardware refresh? What's the feel? Um, I think I can take that one. I think the big fear was what's going to happen on, like, I think it was originally April 4th is when, you know, the transaction concluded and supposedly the former licensure was completely supposed to be coming null and void. A, a number of um, European organizations got together and started a class action against VMware, and they really ruffled the waters. And then VMware started to backpedal a little bit and started pushing out deadlines. Um, so far, we haven't seen anything um, be rendered unoperational. Um, so we're not seeing license revocation or anything ugly like that. So I think that the, I think they're going to leave it alone, and I would recommend that they leave it alone. Um, and let people um, do the appropriate level of due diligence on alternative solutions if cost is the, you know, driving factor behind um, a, the change that they want to see coming forward. Um, and then they created, uh, I didn't get to mention this before, they created the uh, vSphere, um, the vSphere Foundation licensure program, which is um, a, a much less expensive tier to the Cloud Foundation. Um, tier of licensure. And so there's still a very, a lot of questions in the air as to where you can adopt each one of these two license programs and how you can use them and who's allowed to use them and so on and so forth. I think much of those questions are still uh, trying to be unraveled from the uh, license providers. And remember, now you're going to a premier provider who has to go to VMware or to a a tier above him and then so they vmware pushed or broadcom pushed all of the support down to the partner community that is a major modification to what they were doing before and hence you've seen huge layoffs within the organization and i think that's just going to be um their demise to be honest with you because what compelling reason does my competitor have to properly support me or provide the correct answers to remedy a problem when, um, you know, I, I, I think it's a preposterous uh, design in the first place. But, but I think it was a stopgap. It wasn't meant to be to start with. They created a vacuum and then they figured out, okay, there's a big vacuum. What do we do in the meantime before we do the real thing? And then they put those aggregators or uh, in between tier just to help. Uh, I wouldn't call it to help, but to to help themselves prevent even bigger erosion. Do you guys see it the same way? Yeah, I I, I think um, I, going back to your original question, Roni, I think that you know we're the 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 start of the wave. Um, VMware has forty five percent market share and. You know, we're we're seeing interest from every company that we talk to, and in fact, um, we recently polled our our member companies, and 82 percent of them 
have already received interest from organizations seeking a VMware alternative. And 61% of them have already migrated VMware customers to OpenStack. And we're seeing interest globally. That's 13 countries uh, in five continents. And I, I think, you know, we're at a spot here where we're going to see massive, massive interest coming in the, through the rest of 2024, if not 2025. That's my opinion. It's Sorry. definitely, I think it's uh, the time of the opportunity, right? Like the time for for opportunity for people that are uh, looking, recognizing what's going on and uh, deciding, okay, this maybe is the time for us to take action. Um, the, the earlier you are in this, the, the better you are positioned in the market um, and the better that you are uh, at adopting this technology and benefit your, benefiting your business. Okay, um, thank you guys very much. Uh, we do have a few questions from uh, the audience. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'll go through them and we'll try to answer them. Um, again, uh, if anybody at the audience have more questions, please um, uh, feel free to post them. If we won't have time to answer all of them, we will answer them uh, via email. Um, so uh, VMware has been a market leader in virtualization. This is a question that we got um, Earlier today, VMware has been a market leader in virtualization for nearly two decades, and it integrates with many other software and hardware products. How long will it take open source community to replicate the features functionality? Uh, Jimmy, uh, sorry, Cliff, you want to start? Uh, sorry, I was typing an answer. Uh, could you repeat that question? <laughs> 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 uh, VMware has been uh, the market leader in virtualization for uh, nearly two decades, and it yes. integrates with uh, many other software and hardware products. How long will it take open source to replicate? Uh, so that's a tough one, right? Um, this is all about which vendors want to hang their hat on uh, a cart, right? <laughs> and... Um, and, and this was what I was inferring to before. Um, in our world, managed service provider world, as IT professionals, we we hook ourselves to various carts and create tool sets that we educate our team members on and invest time and energy in embracing and learning and optimizing and and using those tools to the benefit of our and user customers, right? And so when you make those investments in uh, tertiary products um, that are married to your virtualization technologies, um, you're, you've locked yourself in to some extent there um, yep. monetarily. And so uh, it's gotta be us who drive the change and put the requests out to the Veeams of the world and Zerto's and, you know, whatever other, um, you know, tertiary add-on third-party technology you, you've adopted, um, RMM and PSA tools and other things. I mean, at the end of the day, um, we have to continue to support our end user requirements and make sure that their stuff is rock solid and safeguarded. Um, and the virtualization technology shouldn't really be the biggest uh, component in that decision-making process, right? Because at so the end of the day, I think reliability right. is your number one, reliability and security are your number one considerations. And I would, and, add, scal um, and I would add scalability to that. Um, I, I, I agree, except that our the SMB marketplace is typically a smaller ecosystem and so scalability from that perspective isn't as important to the end user. There are enterprise grade solutions out there that need massively scalable solutions. And yes, Virtuoso's OpenStack has the ability to scale to thousands of nodes. And there are hardly any other products out there today that can accomplish that objective. So do you, thank you, uh, Cliff. Uh, do you see the pressure building up on the likes of Veeam, Zerto and others to adapt open source as a venue um, for their products, where if we look at Vim, for example, they were very much locked um, into uh, VMware. They had no interest. They actually 
uh, actively push back on adopting open source or being open to open source. Do we see pressure mounting on those companies to adapt open source, to open themselves to uh, open stack? It's, yeah. it's a business, you know? I mean, at the end of the day, it's a business, right? Um, is it in your business interest as VM to actually have an open source solution? And to what end is that? Are you going to end up closing that open source solution eventually? Um, we've seen that happen before on Linux as well. Um, it's at the end of the day, it's a business. So if you're going for that, uh, I hope that your trust is put in the right place here because at the end of the day, it's a business model. Um, and um, yeah, that's very concerning. Uh, dirty secret, Beam actually has OpenStack backup. So just for the record, it's, they just don't talk about it. But... Yeah, well, they do have it, but it's uh, agent-based, not agent-less. Um, so the, to for 100% replication of what they've done with VMware, if there were, would have been 100% um, replication into OpenStack, I think that it will allow them to maintain their market domination. If not, they will lose a lot of customers. Yes. I, I mean... Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the way the market's going, and it, that's to Cliff's point is it's these companies are going to have to adapt, right? As as open stack adoption increases, um, I, I I would like to address your original point though, Roni, about like how long does it take to replicate these features for for open source? And I would argue that open stack is already there. Um, you know, there it's not maybe it's not agentless Beam, but there are backup solutions. There are recovery solutions there are storage solutions monitoring solutions like that's all this all exists and in fact OpenStack just had its 29th on-time release built by more than 70 organizations uh I, I would say that that OpenStack is as rock solid and flexible and nimble as if not more so than vmware ever was um you know it's it's a mature platform. I yeah. wouldn't say that it's it's because or it's for any lack in OpenStack. It's a, just a, a commercial business decision by the likes of him and others that they want to be able to maintain their closed garden relationship with VMware. But now where this garden is kind of breached and customers are running away, do you want to lose this market share just because of convenience or do you want to open yourself up? For sure, OpenStack have all the features to bring in the likes of Vim and to enable their functionality on OpenStack, but it takes two to tango in this case. Um, we have another question. Uh, does OpenStack have a bright future after Red Hat gives up supporting it in favor of OpenShift? Jimmy, I think I'll hand it to you. Uh, sure. So uh, first, I would say that, um, you know, as I mentioned, OpenStack is, is mature and fully baked, and we've got a, a broad ecosystem uh, with the support of over 700 organizations uh, and, and, and a community of 110,000 people that are working on, looking at, using part of the ecosystem. Uh, it, it's, it, it's not just Red Hat that is part of OpenStack. Now, Red Hat played a big part in it, sure, but so have organizations like, over the years, Rackspace, Intel, uh, VexHost, uh, OVH. I mean, the, the amount of contributors and the amount of organizations that have been a part of building the OpenStack software is is huge. Um, yeah. I would also add uh, OpenShift runs on OpenStack, or at least OpenShift can't run without OpenStack. So it's to me that's that's kind of a, a non question, but but I get that that's the the market perception that's is that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I, I think OpenStack reached um, uh, a momentum and a critical mass that is self-sustained. So it, it 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 does require a lot of support from other technology providers, but it can diversify with technology. It can grow on its own inertia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we are about four minutes to the hour and uh, we have plenty of questions. So what we'll do, we'll answer those rest, uh, the rest of the questions and the ones that are in the webinar itself um, via email, via um, 
a communication that we will send to you. With that, I would like to thank my panelists, uh, partners, panelists uh, for their time uh, and the audience, of course. Uh, thank you for taking an hour from your time and uh, joining us. We had uh, at, at the top, we had uh, about 76 uh, participants um, from across the world. That's uh, quite surprising. I know that it's not a very comfortable hour in a lot of uh, other time zones. So thank you all for joining us and uh, we will try to make more of those webinars to kind of educate on the progress of, uh, of OpenStack and how we can commercialize and drive uh, better adoption of OpenStack to, to the customer needs. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you everyone.